say. Well done, great job. Really enjoyed hearing Steve lead us in uh, communion and, and then the offering. After that, I want to hear that fellow preach. <laughs> but all around, good job, fellows. Well, my favorite holiday arrives this week. Um, and no, it's not because of all the food. It's partly because of all the great food, but I just love the holiday and, and the time of year and being able to get together with family and to sort of be forced, I guess, to think of all the things we're thankful for. And uh, food certainly doesn't hurt. This morning, in our message, I want to give thanks for the church. And I'm not speaking this morning so much of the church universal, although I love it and it deserves much thanks, but I am speaking of this church, of this congregation of the church, and of you as one of the parts of this church. Now, it's difficult in preaching, as in every area of life, to maintain balance. Now, the preacher must balance how he spends his time, uh, time for study of the word and prayer, and, and then time for personal interaction with God's people. He must balance the amount of time he spends with various segments of the congregation. And he must balance his preaching, what to preach about, and when to preach about it, and from what part of scripture. All these things must be considered. And I am conscious of the fact that very often in preaching, we are calling on people to do better. We, we're calling on people to do more, perhaps. Sometimes we're calling on people to repent. And sometimes we're calling for people to be baptized if they have never committed their lives to Jesus. And so in that sense, sermons might often sound critical, uh, maybe even negative. In the Apostle Paul's instructions to a younger preacher named Timothy, he said that the preacher should do three things in his preaching. He should convince, rebuke, and encourage. You can read that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And so to be balanced, preaching should do all three, but probably the one that... Um, is most often lacking is the last one, encouragement. So I hope that it never sounds like I'm ungrateful for you or for this congregation because that's certainly not the case. One time at the post office, there was a, a man writing at the desk and he was uh, approached by an older fellow that uh, had a postcard in his hand and the older man said, sir, could you please address this postcard for me? And the man took it and he gladly did so. And then he also agreed to write a short message for him and, and sign the card for the man. And, and finally, the younger man asked, is there anything else I can do for you? And the old fellow thought about that for a moment. And he said, yes, at the end, could you put... P.S. Please excuse the sloppy handwriting. <laughs> well, you see, sometimes we are tempted to complain against those who do the most for us. And this morning I want to encourage you by expressing my thankfulness for you. You who are my brothers and sisters in Christ. But I'd like to do it, um, not so much with my words, but the words and the voice of another person 
uh, that of the Apostle Paul. In particular, some words that Paul wrote to the Philippians in the opening of that letter. At the beginning of the Philippian letter, chapter 1, Paul spends several verses singing the praises of this church and, and thereby encouraging them as he begins his writing to them. And I want to use his words to say similar things to you this morning. Uh, but let's hear his words first. We're going to begin uh, verse 3, Philippians chapter 1, read down through verse 11. Let's hear what Paul wrote to them. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So why was Paul so thankful for Philippi? Why did he pray for them constantly? And in a similar way, why am I so thankful for you? And why are you always in my prayers? Well, the first thing is because of our partnership in the gospel. Notice there in the opening couple of verses, he, he refers to this partnership in the gospel. The word there is koinonia. It's usually translated fellowship or sharing. And I want to praise you as, as a congregation today because you are indeed true partners with us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now notice here that, that fellowship and partnership and sharing is a lot more than just potluck dinners and, and uh, outings and activities. Those things are included, certainly, but it's more than that. And you certainly know how to do those things in an excellent way. But the word here refers to a close association in a particular work. And that work is the spread of the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is a costly cooperation, if you will, in advancing the kingdom of heaven. There's a cost in this fellowship. Now, Paul specifies in other places what he means here with, with this particular church. In chapter 4 of the book of Philippians, verses 15 and 16, he writes this. He says, and, and you Philippians yourselves know the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Paul saw his relationship with the Philippians and the, and the brothers and sisters there as sort of a two-way street. Uh, he served them through teaching and preaching and ministry, and, and they served him, among other ways, uh, by financially supporting him in his missionary work. In fact, in the early years of his work, he says they were the only ones doing it. They were the only ones that were supporting him. Uh, you can read about um, more details of that over in uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, where he, to another church, praises the, the Philippian church. And so this partnership in the gospel involves ministry, and it involves money. And one of the many reasons that I'm thankful for you today is that you have chosen to support me in my gospel ministry in a very generous way. And I hope and pray that I am returning that generosity in ministry to you. But it's not just, it's not just paying the preacher. There are many other ways that your generosity is blessing people's lives and fulfilling the ministry of the gospel. Just think about some of them that I reflected on this week. Uh, there are several mission works around the world that you partner together with us in supporting. We have missions that we support in, in Miami, Florida, in Haiti, in Kenya, in Tanzania, and other places on, on this globe. That doesn't happen without your generosity, folks. It just doesn't happen. You have to have money to support those things. And also, you know, we are meeting needs in our surrounding community as we find out about them. And We'd like to find out about more that we can support. Um, just one small example, that little box out there that you drive past as you come in. If you don't know, that thing is hard to keep full. And it's not because of any lack of your donations. It's because people know about it and are coming and, and receiving blessings there. Uh, and we are apparently meeting a need for some in our community, just in that one benevolent ministry. You ought to ask uh, Tom Lavender sometime to tell you about, to tell you a little bit of the story of, of a sister named Enza Pandolfini. I'm not sure I pronounced that right, but it's something like that. A sister of ours in Italy. I love just saying that name. Uh, we had a song leader down in West Virginia, uh, Benny Colantoni. Actually, his name was Benedetto Giuseppe Colantoni. But he was Benny Tice, one of our song leaders down there, and I just love saying his name. I love saying Enza's name. Enza, um, we are supporting her in her sort of declining years in Italy. She's a a wife of an Italian missionary, a widow of an Italian missionary named Otello that uh, this congregation and others supported for decades. And, and just what a wonderful benevolent work that is to help her in a time of real need. Because all her life she has served the kingdom, you see, and she's in need now. Ask him sometime more about that. It's a wonderful story. I think of other things going on. I'm most hesitant to name specific things because there's, there's so many that are worthy, but you know, we are building a youth program here led by Luke and Sarah and, and many others that I think is becoming a bright light in our community. And, um, and, and all of that, all those kinds of things they happen, you see, they happen with the blessing of God and with the generosity of this church. Without your sacrifice of both time and money, on a weekly basis, it doesn't happen. Without your partnership, you see, it doesn't happen. So I commend you for your generosity through the years, and I pray that it continues, and I pray that it grows. It's important that it grows. If the church is to grow, our partnership has to grow. And so I pray that that happens, that God's work might grow among us as well. I'm thankful for that. 
But Paul was thankful for the Philippians, and I'm thankful for you for another reason. The second one is because of your good works. Look again at verse 6 of the text there in Philippians 1. He says, And I am sure of this, that the he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Notice that Paul's very careful here. He is not preaching a works-based salvation. What does he say began this good work? God and Jesus Christ. When, when you became a Christian, Jesus began a good work in you that will be completed by Jesus at the day of judgment. Jesus' good work is shown in your good works. So I'm thankful today for your good works. You are truly partners in the gospel because you sacrifice not only your money, but your time and your gifts and your skills in an effort to help advance the cause of Christ. This church is most certainly not a one-person or a two-person show. There are many who are pitching in to do the work that needs to be done in many areas. You know, we have uh, people who are teaching Bible classes routinely, regularly. They have people who help them. Though all the people that work in that area could, would be very honest to say, we're always looking for more. But we're so thankful for their work. There are people who see to it that we are organized when we assemble on Sunday and, and, and all the, the fellows who are going to lead us publicly are in their place and have their assignment and they, they check on that and make sure it happens every week. It doesn't just happen naturally. There are people uh, right now back in the back that are making sure you can hear my voice and that um, the screen is working and so forth. Um, and they're there every week. There are people who help look after this building um, and its physical needs. There are people who are out there every week. They're visiting folks. They're, they're visiting shut-ins, hospital, hospitalized people, and, and people in their homes. We have people that are prayer warriors that are constantly in prayer for those in need. And they're card senders. Um, so many areas of, of service, many of which get no, or at least little, public recognition. All of them good works. I am so thankful today for that. I know of places, congregations, that don't have that. And my understanding is you always have. I know you have since I've known you. I have always wanted to, to work hard and do my best for Lancaster. But never because I felt that if I didn't, things would just fall apart. That's never been my thought process. I know better. You all care too much. You are hard workers. Again, it's not like that every place. In a lot of places, if the minister slowed down or the minister quit, it would fall apart because he was doing it all to begin with. I guarantee you, I'm not doing it all. It's just not the case here, and may it never be the case here. I want you to note particularly that Paul here says that God will bring to completion this good work in you. I think that means that we should expect it to continue, that is the good works, that we should expect it to grow, and we should expect it to get better. Now, I really want that to be our mindset. We expect those things. And if, if we will continue 
to be true partners in the gospel at will. Third, notice the thanksgiving here. I thank my God for this church because of our genuine love for each other. If you look at the next verse, verse 7, Paul writes, It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. You hear that true depth of feeling between the apostle and the Philippian church? It's, it's genuine and it's rich. And, and I am confident there is a similar type of love and evidence right here among us in, in Lancaster. If I tried to fully list all the examples of the love you've exhibited for me and my family, um, we'd be here until midnight. And someone might fall out a window, who knows? <laughs> and I'm not Paul, so we don't want that to happen. If you don't know what I'm referring to, read the book of Acts. But I'm confident we have a similar kind of thing happening here. Um, we see it all the time. I have seen you, you folks come around people that were hurting and love on them. I have seen you welcome new people to our assembly with, with genuine warmth. And I, I, I suppose if, if somebody were asking me to name one outstanding thing about you all that I've noticed from day one of our association, it is your warmth to new people. What a rich trait. Again, that is not common and it isn't found everywhere. I've been places where it is cold, folks. And I'm not talking about the room temperature. But it is warm here. I am so thankful to be at a place where love is genuine and commitment to one another is real. Never take it for granted. Never take it for granted. And so today I'm thankful for your partnership, I'm thankful for your good works, and I'm thankful for your love. And for that reason, like the Apostle Paul, I want to pray certain things for you. The following things. First, I pray that this love will grow. Again, verse 9 of the text. I pray that this fellowship of Christians will only increase, that our feelings for each other will only deepen, and that more and more people will be able to be a part of this loving church because they look at us and they see that we are true disciples of Jesus Christ because of our love for one another. I pray that our love will grow, as Paul says, that it will bound more and more. Second, I pray that your knowledge will increase. This is in verse 9 as well. Most likely he's referring to religious knowledge, to knowing spiritual things, and, and today, especially for us, uh, to knowing the scriptures better and better. Uh, the scriptures are able to make us wise into salvation. And I'm convinced that, and Paul says it right here, that as our spiritual knowledge increases, so will our love for one another. One affects the other. So I pray that this will happen for you. And, and I promise that I will do everything I can in my preaching and in my teaching to see that it does, that your knowledge will increase. Third, I pray that your discernment will increase. That's in verses 9 and 10. Now, discernment isn't a word that we use much. Um, we might understand it better if we use the word insight. We, that, that's a word we use more frequently. It, re it really refers to using the knowledge that you gain. 
It refers to being able to apply spiritual truth to specific situations. It's moral perception. It's making good choices. It's having the right priorities as a church. You can have a lot of priorities. Some of them might not be the right ones. Discernment is having the right ones. It's distinguishing things that really matter from a variety of competing possibilities. I pray that our spiritual insight will increase and abound at this place. And finally, the fourth thing I pray along with Paul, is that on the day of judgment, you each will appear pure and blameless before God. That's in verse 10. In other words, I pray that we'll all go to heaven together. Everyone in this room today, without exception. Everyone watching on the live stream, that we'll all go to heaven together. If we do, it will be because of God's grace generated at the cross of Christ. And it will be because we have done the work of encouraging one another along the way and kept each other faithful through our spiritual partnership in this world. And so when we stand before the throne of God on that great day that's coming, He'll be able to say to us, well done. Because when he looks at us, he sees his son. That's, that's my prayer for us. We have a special fellowship here. It is to be cherished. It is to be protected and guarded from any who would destroy it. But most of all, it's something to be thankful for. So I thank my God every time I remember you. We're going to stand with Tom and sing another song. If we can be of help to you this morning through prayer or other service, we want to be. But I hope you'll think about these words of Paul and how they might build us up. Let's stand. Let's see. They tried my love.